What is up, Theology Nerds? This is Trip, And today on the podcast, it's a special episode. It's a different type of episode. Why? Because my friend David Trotter is going to be interviewing me. That's right. Uh, I was just on the Road to Edmund podcast. He interviewed me about the Road to Edmund. What is the Road to Edmund? Is that a literal podcast about a road that goes to the town in Oklahoma called Edmund? Nope. The Road to Edmund is a movie I made last summer. That's right. I uh, made a movie with a group of my friends. We made a movie. It's an indie film. And uh, the podcast that you're about to hear is him interviewing me about the questions around faith, sexuality, Jesus, salvation, um, indie filmmaking, crazy experiences that happened while we made the film. Uh, it's, it's a ton of fun. I thought you'd enjoy it. And I also wanted to use this as a chance to say, hey, if you're interested in um, seeing the film and even seeing the trailer of the film that's about to come out, then go to theroadtoedmond.com and sign up for their email list. Or if you're on the homebrewed email list, click the button in the one that goes out today when this podcast came out and say you want to get the emails telling you about the film, getting to see the trailer first. But most importantly, we are going to be touring uh, the first version of this film in the, in the late in the spring and in the summer. And I'm looking for places where they would like us to show screen this film. It's the first kind of buddy road trip comedy that explores progressive spiritual themes. So it's going to be the best in that genre of all time. it would also be the worst and the first. But I'm looking for places that want to host a screening and um, it could be a church. It could be just a group of people who are like, we can get a big ass group of people together to watch this film and give you feedback and input and such. It could be a school, a div school, seminary or whatever. But if you're interested in doing it, then let us know because uh, we're trying to find places where homebrewed Christianity listeners are down. And what we're doing to make the tour and everything happen is uh, the people supporting funding the film, they're going to make sure we're able to do the screening and get David, the director there, and me. And I'm doing anything and everything uh, to make it financially possible. So, like, if your group wants me to help run um, a live podcast, a one-day event, uh, to do teaching, training, whatever it is I can do that you want me to do, to help get the people together, to have the money to be able to put on the screening, then I'll do it. If you want me to uh, help run uh, a book release party online or a social media campaign or whatever you want, I'm basically told all my friends help put this movie together. I'm so excited for homebrewed listeners to get to see it and give input so we can edit it and so then we can take it out big time that I will do whatever I can to make the screenings possible so that my people get to see it. And at the screening, it'll be, it'll be, uh, you'll get to see the movie, and we're going to do some Q&A and fun stuff, kind of like a live podcast. So uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation. Go to theroaddeadman.com. Let me know that you're, uh, if you're interested in hosting a screening or being a part of one in your area. Um, but, but also just sign up, because when the trailer comes out, I want all of you to get to see it. It was a ton of fun making the movie. And, and I'm sure you'll hear about that. Um, before before we jump in, just want to remind you, if you if you want to join the pop-up community, Surviving the Bible for Lent, do it. Go to survivingthebible.club. That's right. We're having a pop-up community where we're going to be tackling the lectionary text a week out, ministers. That's right. We're going to be talking about the lectionary text before you have to preach them. So you can be engaging in that conversation. It can inspire your homiletical genius we're also going to be answering questions about the bible about text about text in the bible every day throughout lent me and christian and amy pyatt we're going to be doing it and a whole host of other people there's already like a thousand people in the group you should join it up go to surviving the bible dot club yeah this would be the first time you've probably joined an internet club and and how and how cool is that? You're gonna you're gonna I'm gonna gonna read the Bible this one. I'm gonna survive it. So this is a group. If you're a heretic, if you're a skeptic, if you're a doubter, if you got stacks of questions about the Bible, and you're like ah, giving up giving up God, atheism for Lent style with Peter Rollins, that's too easy for me. But if you want to join that, you can use the code Homebrewed15 get discount. 
<laughs> I'm saying, like, if you still want to do that, you can. But if you're just like, nah, nah, that's it. I, I, I want to go hardcore. I'm going to read that book that's been so frustrating, irritating, and plaguing my life so long. I'm going to wrestle with it. Or if you've like never read it before and you're like, I'm actually going to read this thing, then we're going to do it. We're going to wrestle with it. It's going to be awesome. Surviving the Bible dot club. Now, here's David Trotter asking me questions about my faith, about this film, and a whole host of other things. Enjoy. Welcome to the Road to Edmund podcast. My name is Dave Trotter, and I have the inimitable Trip Fuller on the line today. Welcome, Trip. What's up? Do you have a Diet Dr. Pepper with you? Because I've got one. I, I brought an extra one for you if you... Uh, I have I have LaCroix. LaCroix. God, you're addicted to those things as much as I am to Diet Dr. Pepper. I, I like to rotate, you know, from uh, fruit essence, carbonated water to Diet Dr. Pepper. It's uh, It really was the only two forms of hydration while filming uh, The Road Deadman. It's the only... F- hydration in my life is diet dr pepper actually my family has a concern about it hey for those of you who are listening um uh, trip literally just jumped on this video cast we have no pre-conversation there's no pre-production meeting on what we're going to ask so this is live in person crazy i'm sitting here in southern california trip is in raleigh north carolina do you have snow is there snow there we did it's melted but we did have snow last week. Now it's nasty slush. Now, I got my car stuck in the grass. I parked it, and then it snowed. It melted, and when I tried to pull out of the driveway, I like dug a ditch. Oh man, I did that with white lightning when we dropped it back off at the place that we were borrowing it from. It <laughs> slid into a wet ditch. If you want to see that photo, you can go to our Instagram or Facebook feed and go back. And I peeled out and it just literally, I just left it there stuck. It's basically on its side almost. White Lightning is a co-star in the film, if you don't know. It is the big white van. People, um, if you want to know for trivia, for the Road to Edmund, Road to Edmund trivia uh, contest that I'm sure you're already planning uh, after the screenings that you watch, um, one of the answers is, how did White Lightning get its name? Uh, when I picked it up from the guy uh, that I was borrowing it from, and I say borrow because there's a crazy <laughs> story behind how we got the van. I looked at it and I just said, White Lightning. It Like, boom, it just came. It was divine providence that came into my heart of hearts and sat next to Jesus who sits in my heart. Praise the Lord. White lightning, and um, and when you if you haven't seen a picture of this amazing fifteen passenger van, you should. Little did we know in the second week of filming that the rust really accumulated, and when it rains, white lightning cries all over the driver and the passenger in the front and in the seat. So we had uh, Nathan and I are driving between shots while it's raining. And we have uh, two ginormous plastic margarita cups duct taped to the dashboard where it's dripping to collect water because it kept like spraying while we're trying to drive. And we're like, it's going to it's going to get all (laughs) all in the tape player and stuff or in the in some electronic blow. (laughs) And when you watch the film, you will be able to tell the scenes in the van, which ones were shot early in the trip versus late in the trip. The ones who, uh, the one shots that were shot late in the trip will have a sound to them. Uh, and it was the left tire, like basically coming off or something. We don't know. It was a problem. White lightning was like, I thought this, I thought this was a one week filming. Like are y'all done with your film yet. Let me cry about it. So, if you it, it slowly the max speed of the van went down as we as the movie went on, it, it would start shaking horribly at 70 and then at 60. And then it's like you aren't even going the speed limit on the interstate unless you want to consider dying. Uh, 
For those of you who wonder when you watch the film why so much footage in the van is of the side of Larry's head and the side and or back of Cleo's head, it's because we could not figure out a way to mount the cameras in the front part of the van without them shaking tremendously. We're talking high quality mounts. We're talking now, okay, we didn't put the van on a trailer like, you know, ye old Hollywood pictures because. We didn't have the budget to do all that. No, no, it's because we're authentic, Dave. It's very authentic. Yeah, we're trying to be authentic. You are sitting in the back seat. That's where you're sitting. Yeah. Yeah. You're sitting in the back seat with Larry and Cleo. It's very powerful. All right. Uh, uh, Trip. Dave. I'm going to ask you some questions. Yeah, you are. That I have not asked you before, like things that I'm genuinely interested about. All right. All right. How. Would you describe your faith right now? I know you talk about faith a lot on the Homebrew Christianity podcast and these live events, and you go speak everywhere. You're famous and rich and all this stuff. (laughs) How would you describe your faith? Um, Well, I guess uh, the... I have, I think, of a deep joy to my faith that um, has all has made it ever since I ever since I kind of came to faith again and with a second naivete where you you aren't just believing you're just not just like still believing all the things you were told when you were a kid but when you believe them again and hold them in a in a more mature adult way um, since then, the joy in my faith has continued to grow, even if the, I don't know, the questions I have might get bigger or the challenges or struggle or pain in life might waver and stuff. My faith has, the joy of it's kind of continued to grow. And um, now, unlike five, if the difference between now and five years ago is... I'm much more likely to go to bed and wake up aware of the presence of God. And um, so if you think about where I am in my faith, I think there's a lot of my spiritual practice, like in doing like contemplative prayer and that type of stuff, even reading scripture, I have a PhD and really know how to deconstruct it like a champ, but even that it's become naturally a critical and a spiritual exercise as, as before there used to be a time where I couldn't turn off all the critical thinking or I don't know about this historically. Well, it says this in this other passage or whatever, all that's still there, but then just like engaging in worship or communion or scripture and things like that, the joy of it, the childlike style of faith and receiving it as a gift is oh, it's more rich now than it's been any time in my adulthood. So, wow. and I think part of it is learning it from your children. Mm. Honestly, like um, when you see your kids uh, um, receiving, yeah, you know, receiving the stories or the first time they have communion and these type of things, and they hear uh, this, this is our celebration of God's gift to us and stuff like that. Um, watching them come to share this ancient tradition that's been passed down and stuff makes you realize that, yeah, there's a reason I started the giant quest of questions and doubts and heresies and stuff. And it really was that, you know, in my family, in my culture, the, this is the tradition of wisdom that's given me, uh, a deeper experience of life and giving me the questions to wrestle with and, and pushed me into uh, living with more integrity and compassion and, and striving for greater justice and beauty in the world. And I, I guess the, you know, the annoying things about tradition are all still there, but there's a certain beauty to it. And so I try to lean into uh, lean into that. Do you feel like your personality, and I I have not known you long. I've only known you for a couple of years. Do you feel like your personality 
lends itself to that perspective. Like you seem a pretty gracious person. You, you seem like a pretty joyful person. You seem like a person who rolls with the punches, you know, like, do you feel like your personality lend, lends itself to that place in life that you find yourself now? I, I imagine so. Like, and, and I say that not because, um, here's this is what goes to my head when you ask that is I know plenty of people who would go uh, that know me that would go, if I did not know you, I would think what you just said sounds like bullshit. Like, and if they know me, they're like, yeah, yeah, I get makes sense. I guess that's how trip rolls. Cause uh, even friends or family who've experienced some of the same pains and hurts from religious institutions and stuff or, or trauma around it and things like that, it's landed different and, and it's hung around differently and I don't like see them and go like, oh, geez, you should <laughs> you should be more like me or something. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so there's probably definitely something about my personality about it. But I also think maybe the other part of it is um, once, once you kind of come face to face with those first few big, extremely painful experiences, betrayals, hurts, griefs. And um, if you've learned to process those, then I think that's just a, it becomes a utility. And I had really cool, amazing patient mentors at times where my life was real difficult. And so I think it's put things in a different perspective for me. Yeah. Yeah. Who, but who also be- like I, I grew up it, like church was, uh, my like the institution itself did really cool things when I was growing up. So my family were church planners. And so the church was w- one of the places where we were more inclusive and more committed to justice and that kind of thing. So uh, it, it's real different than those who grew up in the church was the place they heard stories. They're embarrassed to say later in life kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That wasn't, that wasn't mine. And so because of those positive experiences early on, and seeing the possibilities of, you know, people that had no connection to a religious tradition or community find it in a church we were planning and, and, and their lives be radically impacted and things like that. I, uh, I guess, uh, you know, chapter one was positive enough. Sure. It reframes the story as opposed to, you know, we're talking, I'm like, I grew up in this place and I can't stand these things about it. And I have this right. frustration and anger, but right, then I right. like this other part and I don't know what to do with it. Sure. That's not my story. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, a part of your story that that I see is that there's a uh, people, uh, you're very beloved. You know what I mean? People love you. People care about you. And there's not so much of a controversy that surrounds you unless you get a little too many beers in you, then there's some controversy. Uh, but I know I get more conservative the more I drink. Yeah. Right. Um, you know what I mean? Versus somebody who maybe came from an evangelical background and then began to shift or ask different questions or something. It seems like that, uh, the people on the interwebs have left you alone because you, uh, maybe you were always crazy and, and a heretic. That's a question. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, well, I'll put it this way. I, I got, I started saying what I was thinking on the internet way before I thought about whether it was a good idea. Uh So I have multiple opinions. If you go back, the the podcast is almost 10 years old at this point. So I've probably had multiple opinions on on different (laughs) things. And, and so, you know, in one sense, I go and say, I hate religious people where there's multiple versions of themselves. And, uh, uh, there's a scene in the film where my character loses it about one of the ministers. There were several scenes. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> about the you know the senior minister at the church where there's like this different version of yourself and you know, yes. what do you really believe versus what you'll say to your congregation and what yeah. you'll say to other you know faith leaders and like I, that is just gross to me hmm. and because um, you know if if Jesus was going to act that way. He really would have uh, uh, had to check and see who was listening at the Sermon on the Mount and definitely not wanted anyone to retell it. Because uh, if you just get up at church on Sunday and read the Sermon on the Mount, which, well, I memorized it and told it as a sermon. Um, I got told afterwards, like, 
it just sounds like you're preaching a bunch of that leftist agenda and you know you're just you, you just should leave america because if you just really start loving your enemies and turning the other cheek we're not even going to have uh, a country and you start so uh like i think there can be a a, a sense that um Part of the attraction of Jesus is is his clarity about the important things, um, be it who was loved and valued and all that kind of stuff. And the church uh, gets real vague and ambiguous about it when they think um, that the people they're serving actually don't love and trust them for who they are. They love and trust them to perform a function. And so they hide themselves or you know, get ambiguous. And that drives me up a wall. So since I've already had it on the internet, I've never had the luxury of, uh, being at, when I worked in a congregation or at an interview for a church job or something like that, you know, uh, deciding what I said or didn't say, cause it's, it's out there. It's already on the internet. You're naked. You're naked on the web. You can tell some, another thing is you're not your ideas. And I don't understand why religious people think this so much. Like, you and I could have completely different opinions, and I could think that yours are you're an ignoramus, and it's not logical or sensible or biblical or whatever the word is you use to assess it. And but you're not your ideas. Like, like you will have different ideas about things your entire life. Mm-hmm. And if you're a Christian, God did not redeem one version of you at one point where you happen to have the most right ideas at one time, yes. God redeemed you. Your, your full story is being woven into the body of Christ and the bo- and, and, and shares in God forever. So what about that makes you think like the primary things, your ideas, the, the gospel is about what God thinks is true about you, not what you think is true about God or yourself. Mm-hmm. And so if you're not your ideas, it, then I think you should be free to be as right and wrong and inarticulate and confused and, and confident on one day and doubting on the other day and stuff. And it is so how, how does, how does a pastor or a leader lead in the way that you're describing where there's a, uh, a freedom to have different perspectives when the church system for the most part is expecting a certain set of beliefs to be consistent how does a pastor lead in that way that you're describing? Well, I, I mean, I think part of it is a lot of that tension's really big right now. But if you go back in time, there are hundreds of years in the row where that was not a big deal for the church. And not because you can't see dramatically different opinions on all sorts of different doctrines and stuff. Um, what we have right now, especially around sexuality and religious pluralism, are uh, the actual touch time of congregants and faith leaders with people with, with sexualities that don't fit in the 1950s America version. And uh, you have growing diversity on, on race, sexuality, religious pluralism and such. And the, the world you're encountering just day to day in your neighborhoods and your jobs and such is one that you used to see, you know, cohere more tightly with the world you prayed about and spoke about and preached about in church. And now the, the contact time with the bigger diversity of God's creation and God's people leads to a tension mm-hmm. that um, gets resolved in a lot of different ways. But it, I don't think we should be shocked to find out that the people we've called – and trained to care about the gospel, to care about your congregation, the community your church is in, to call, they're called to live, serve, and, and such, are the ones in a congregation who first question received authority that, like, you can't be gay and be a Christian, or that uh, the gospel's primarily about getting people to join Team Jesus because they're the only ones that go to heaven or something. Mm-hmm. Because that's actually what they were called to do, like, part of being a minister is that you're given the gift of time to wrestle with Scripture, to think things through, and to be available to be the body of Christ on the worst day for people in your community. Mm -hmm. Like Those are the the two – I mean, when I'm a minister, that's my favorite part, is I know there are 800 people that were tithing so that if anyone's friends, best friends, someone they knew in the community, they needed someone to show up, care, and listen to them, I got to do that. Mm -hmm. And then they knew I was spending time in the week to think about 
how we were going to use art to unpack a scripture in worship, how I was going to listen to different people in the congregation to find stories to do the same or planning all sorts of stuff. That's what ministers do. So it should, it seems to me that if you're in a more conservative context, that when ministers or the faith of the leaders in the congregation, they're more likely going to voice or have un- dis-ease earlier. Mm-hmm. These are the ones that are actually taking that touch time and putting it in, in wrestle with scripture mm-hmm. in their faith. But when someone like that voices it, you're amazed how many people that are sitting in the congregation that nodded the week before when you say, uh, a marriage is between a man and a woman. Mm-hmm. And then you say, you know what? The most beautiful thing about marriage is that that's when two human beings enter into a covenant that's holy, where they said, I'm going to show up for you, and I don't know who you're going to be the next day. And that picture of that love and that commitment that these two people enter into is a way of us to attempt to live out God's commitment to God's people in Israel and God's people to us through Christ, that God has said, I am the God of love and refuse to be God without you, and I will show up every day for you are mine and I am yours. Mm -hmm. And that, where are we going to figure this out? Where's the laboratory of that type of love? It's in a marriage. Because humans are so screwed up, we won't even figure it out with one person. Mm -hmm. But how beautiful is it? So how does the congregation respond the next week? They nod. Because it's so. there's plenty of them that I think are sitting there and go, oh, yeah, that makes more sense because I've had these experiences, encounters with people. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I think the... There's a there's a a real uh, inertia that you can see taking place, and when you're given the opportunity or the possibility, the language to have a more open and inclusive vision of the faith, uh, I think there are people that have already had the experiences and already had the relationships. Yes, but they haven't have a way to to say yes to it. Yeah, and so the to to me one of the uh, one of the things I hope a film like this does is it it's a different way of saying, well, let's have a conversation about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the thing is like, and not everyone's going to end up agreeing about it in, in any way, but I do think it's uh, disingenuous for us as Christians to use the word truth all the time and insist that our congregations to be spaces, a different opinion isn't welcome. Mm-hmm. That seems that seems odd to me. Well, it doesn't be, mean you can't have one that's not normative. But uh, if you're just scared of people voicing the questions that come out of their experience in their life, that's um, a little uncomfortable. No, I I think you're right. I I think the challenge comes in when the leader or leaders is voicing those questions and uh, about what is normative, and then. It causes an entire congregation to have to, to wrestle with that. And there have been several leaders who have come from more conservative perspectives that have voiced those, not just questions, but, but beliefs. And they've been, some have been ostracized and some have been embraced. Um, I just saw a, uh, a, I think it's Netflix is doing a show on Carlton Pearson. Did you see that? Mm-hmm. No. Uh, Carlton Pearson was the but I mean, Pente- I know Carlton Pearson. Yeah, Pentecostal pastor who who changed some perspectives. They're doing a full show on it because uh, Ira Glass is the uh, I think producer, maybe director uh, behind oh, it. Oh, cool. Um, so those the these types of conversations are happening, but they're happening behind closed doors. I do wonder how many people who are not the board members in churches are sitting in the seats on Sundays. And like you said, they've already had these experiences with their uh, kids being in a class with other kids who have two moms or two dads, or they have a neighbor, or they have a a sister or a brother or an uncle or whatever. They've had these encounters with people who are uh, not the same demonized individuals that they've heard about on Sundays, right? Right. They've had a different perspective. They've had a different uh, type of relationship with these individuals. And thoughts are are already there. They're already wrestling with the issue of sexuality. They're already wrestling with the issue of pluralism. And I'm wondering what it would look like for leaders to begin to articulate a more 
inclusive um, perspective that somehow resonates with a conservative mindset. You know what I mean? Like you come to the table. When we have some of these conversations, you come to the table with so much of a um, assumptions sometimes that I'm like, no, 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 people don't, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like people are so back here. Like what would it look like to have that type of conversation in a congregation? Like if you were speaking to a, a pastor who is wrestling with some of these issues, how would you suggest to him or her to begin this conversation? Like, what do you think some first steps would be? Well, I, I mean, the difficulty with how you introduce any type of conversation like this is that um, the people you really have to talk to first are your the gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual members of the congregation or the community who are going to be present. Because if they aren't full of grace and patience, then um, it will it will be harmful. Like the last thing we need when you're trying to become more open is a conversation where people become open and vulnerable by a part of themselves. They thought God needed them to hide in that church, and then they get injured and hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, now... If people are really interested, there are whole processes like denominations like the United Church of Christ and such have created for congregations to have like a mediator come in and facilitate. And there's a whole process for thinking through how you deal with, um, you know, issues around sexuality and the process of deciding as a congregation whether you want to, as a group, be open and affirming or not. Uh, there, there's also resources for how you do um, sex education or whole body education in the church with teenagers, which is one of the places, uh, if you're wanting to address this in a helpful way, is really not just going, oh, well, now, you know, here are these other expressions of sexuality that are okay now because we're inclusive. But actually, what is a healthy way of understanding yourselves as created sexual beings made in the image of God? Mm-hmm. Like the the issue around uh you know like people that aren't home like people that aren't heterosexual any expression like that it's intimately connected to the church's and especially american evangelical obsession with sex hmm. but uh apparently they're getting really loose with it so you know you'd hate to vote for a female methodist sunday school teacher when you can vote for a pussy grabber who pays off uh, a prostitute, For, like yeah, you know, yeah, basically prostitutes with a porn star pays her off, it like pays her off. Oh my god, like you, that is like just so you know, regardless of what stupid ass reason you give for that, like making sense after that, your kids are rolling their eyes. Like there's no chance they're not rolling eyes. Like if you come in and you're like, I voted for Donald Trump, we gave him a we gave him a do over at 64. When he had a three month old and was banging a porn star behind his wife's back, he gets a mulligan in his sixties, but don't you touch titties, 14 year old, or you're going to go to hell. (laughs) No one gives a shit at you anymore. Like you just know the only thing you really care about is the power. And surprisingly, the only type of evangelical Bible believers that are real worried about it are white. So we can go ahead and connect those dots as well. But, um, like, so, you know, I, I, to me, it's just a uh, like, starting I, the conversation. Starting the conversation. How yeah, do you? You have to think of who's going to get hurt. There are lots of resources, but before you have to decide it's worthwhile and that you want to do it. Yeah. And I think for a lot of leaders in, uh, especially white evangelical churches, they enjoy the perks of their job more than the call of their ministry, and so they know what the right thing is to do. They know they need to do it, but they really don't care if they're if their their livelihood and stuff's going to be in jeopardy. Then they come up with stupid reasons, and then they tell it to you and try to justify it to you. And I've had this email conversation that I'm describing with 50 pastors or more. Sure. I know mega church ministers that we would all know the name to, who I've talked to multiple times, who personally are open and affirming and are lying to their congregation or dodging it. And the only time I've seen people that say no after, the, if the Holy Spirit's like, you should think about this. Oh, now you're in a new position. And you're like in this new space. Do you voice in a church? The moment that door gets closed the first time, they get defensive and want to protect whatever it is, the prestige they have, the possessions and stuff they get for their 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 position 
in there. Just and, the salary. Yeah. And so they don't do anything. The only time I've seen people reevaluate after that is after some big tragedy. Yes. Where like a kid in their congregation uh, you find out is hurting themselves or commit suicide or something. And then they're like, oh, oh. But, you know, like think of, I mean, my family are church planners. So like we're like the amount of energy and creativity you put into creating a situation where you can tell someone who already has judged religion as BS Mm -hmm. and especially Christianity that the God who made the world knows them completely and loves them completely. You put a lot of effort and creativity in that. And yet you were, if you know there are people in your congregation who aren't going to hear that and you, and you even think the congregation should be in a different place and you don't say anything, then, you know, you're complicit. And I, Mm -hmm. that's, uh, I mean, I don't think there's an easy way around that. Mm -hmm. Um, now, if you're in transition and you don't really know what you think and stuff, that's a different situation altogether. Sure. Um, I, I honestly think like, you shouldn't, as a minister, start spouting off stuff that's your newest idea you had. Like when you're preaching or speaking as a, as a leader, you need to, you need to speak from like your actual convictions. They should trust that you're going to have three months later. Mm-hmm. Not, uh, well, I'm thinking I might think this or something like that. Sure, it's not appropriate. Yeah, yeah. You need to be in a place where you're at home with yourself, and that. And I think that includes like talking to your partner if you're married about it and deciding what you want to do and whether you voice it together. Uh, I've met friends who, you know, they get all riled up because they're like, oh, "I'm progressive. I'm going to let everyone know at church," and their partner's like uh, in Sunday school, and then like stuff's blowing up, and 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 they're like, "Yeah, I just had to." I just had to tell people they can't be judgmental and blah, 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 blah. like, and you're like, that's a mess. You didn't yeah. talk to your partner. Yeah. Your kids like half heard it and half didn't. Yeah. And, and then like, someone's like, your dad loves the gays. And they're like, what's a gay. And they're like five. And you're now like having to tell your five-year-old daughter, like, and you know, so like, like you don't score extra, like being edgy for Jesus points. If you aren't thoughtful. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Or, anything. or rude. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, so you bring, you bring us, uh, you bring me to the thought of just the road to Edmund. And, um, for those of you who haven't listened, Tripp and I had a conversation that was more of an interview with me on, uh, the road to Edmund for episode one. You might want to go back and listen to that. But, um, just as a quick catch up, I wanted to create a narrative film. I'd done three feature length documentaries, wanted to do a, a scripted narrative film and, wanted to create something that was for specifically Trip and Nathaniel because I knew that they had a relationship that would be synergistic on screen. And so as part of my own spiritual journey, there are questions that I have been having that revolve around sexuality and pluralism. And I wanted to tell a story that interwove those in a way that I thought would be um, commonplace. You know, and so this whole story of Cleo being a youth pastor, uh, for those of you who don't know, he has a girl in his youth group come out to him and he responds in a way that's, um, uh, loving and caring and he's with her and the church does not approve and sends him on kind of a two week Jesus timeout to think through things. Now, I have been, uh, privy to situations where you know, the two week Jesus timeout is basically like, Hey, let's figure out how to fire this guy without getting into a lawsuit. And, uh, it's this time of discernment, right? And so this is, this is commonplace in a lot of more conservative churches. Um, I don't necessarily have, uh, well, let me back up and just say that this is not my story, but it's a story that embedded in it are the questions that I have been wrestling with. And so I wanted to create a piece of art that spurred on those questions with a lot of different people. And Trip has been incredibly um, uh, just integral in the development of the film and the concepts and us wrestling through things and him bringing more ideas. And so Trip. I called you up and we had been talking about some other projects and I was trying to figure out how to rope you guys into something. Um, but when I called you up with this particular idea and we talked about it on the phone, uh, you were 
you were my first call after I processed this with my wife because I knew that I had to get you on board. Because if you weren't on board, I, I didn't want to rally a team or crew and all that stuff. But I thought if I could get you on board, Nathaniel would get on board, and then I could possibly get a crew that I thought would really do a great job. So I call you up and I'm t- pitching you the idea. What are you thinking? Um, well, I mean, the first thing is, uh, if you are like me and you have like, you have your own platform, but you also end up doing lo- you partner with lots of different people for different things. Then, uh, you usually only work with someone a second time. If you think they will attempt to work as hard as you do. And so you're on that list. Like I enjoyed working with you. Um, and so, you know, anyone that ever gets a call from Dave, uh, he, he is a remarkable, uh, talent at like doing what he says and working hard, which is always fun. And I knew like a, a project like this, there would be a lot of time outside of, you know, just doing it. And I like hanging out with you. So that made it fun. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the idea of doing it was exciting and I was, uh, I, I went to art magnet school and was in theater and then started college as a theater and philosophy major. So, uh, I was just arrogant enough to f- not flinch <laughs> at all about starring in a film. I'm like, obviously I could do that. I, well, duh. And by the way, I have, and so I remember thinking it was a good idea rather quickly and spending most of the call, uh, coming up with jokes and moments to stick in the film. Um, and, and one of the other reasons I'd say yes is that uh, there's a huge contingent of youth ministers that listen to homebrewed Christianity. And I've gone to the progressive youth minister conference for years and interacted with them. And so this, there'll be people watching it that are real youth ministers that are like, ha, that was my story. That's me. And, yeah. And so, Actually, there's so many little bits about youth ministry that run through the whole thing that either Nathan's character or mine ends up saying stuff about it. And I didn't make up any of them. I mean, they weren't all my personal experiences, but they were all ones from youth ministers that were so good. I'm like, I got to keep that. And um, so when people, you know, you see the film, like there was no fabricated material uh, needed (laughs) for all that. So, uh, the other part of it is, um, I mean, we've talked about some of the more serious elements, but, you know, outside of the questions part, the part that is really intriguing to me and the thing I think uh, that we discovered as we were working on it is my character Larry's whole backstory, um, where he is in dealing with big questions around God and faith and the church and such, and how the road trip and everything became an opportunity for Larry and Cleo to like hate each other, love each other. And in the process, start to reconcile a lot of dead ends in each of their paths because of this weird situation and the friendship that emerges in it. Um, and I knew once we, I don't want to like ruin the story, but like once you know, once we put together how the last of the road trip was ending and such, I knew like, oh, like when you watch it, you will probably talk more about Larry and Cleo's friendship before you ask any church related question. Sure. But like, and I think that's important because too many times religious people put a generic question about a generic topic on top of something. And then they debate about it. And then what is going through the minds of everyone listening to the debate are actual friends and actual stories. And so the stories in the movie and the, the characters needed to be rich enough that they set the terms of the conversation, not the debate. And the jokes had to be big enough that you got stuck laughing at something that you would, that you would feel guilty laughing for at church. And, that it that it uh it steps on boundaries and and so it, i thought of it as like how do the relationships and how does the um the the laughter part kind of open up space like really well crafted stand up routines where you're laughing you aren't sure you're supposed to be laughing <laughs> but then you're like oh junk they're making me think about something i would have never thought of yeah um and uh 
Well, and I, yeah. I appreciate you brought your whole self to this film. You know, you, uh, we almost see your entire self in this film naked. Uh, almost. There's very <laughs> few parts that are, uh, you know, I did an interview with Nathaniel, you know, and he was like, he said he's never said yes to doing the film still. He was just, it was just assumed. And I said, wait, I, I told Tripp, call Nathaniel and, you know, see if he's up for it. Yeah. He said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He called me, but there was no question. It was just like, yeah, yeah, we're doing this. And uh, when he was asked to take his shirt off for the first time, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa this wasn't in the contract. This wasn't part of the deal. Uh, so you brought your whole self to the film uh, physically and figuratively. And well, it's funny as I told him, like, Actually, removing my clothes was a part of my deal. <laughs> you, uh, you are very present. It is powerful. It is powerful moments. And uh, the end of the film, which we will not discuss, is actually your idea and just a powerful way to bring it all together. And I think people will be uh, very touched by it. Um, as you think about... Uh, the film and people watching this, obviously you haven't seen it yet. It's still in post-production. Um, what do you want people to take away from it? What are you hoping for? Um, well, uh, I, mean, I guess it, there are three different things I think that about the film, I really hope people take away. One is like permission to admit that religion is like, really odd and funny and hilarious and it's okay to admit that and it's actually okay to laugh about it like you actually do your faith no service if it's not even humorous like there's a reason the the uh the lds put ads in the musical book of mormon like it and no one looks at it and it's like if they didn't put an ad in there it's like this is stupid. I can't believe they're making fun of us. Why are there these crazy jokes? I don't like South Park either. No, they put it in there, and it's just like, this is who we are, sure. and I oh, hope you enjoy the show. And, and, like, why? Because they're totally cool owning their identity, and you know it because you've said horrible things about m missionaries that came to your door right after you shut it, and they know you thought and said those things, but they're like, no, this is who I am. And Christians have had so much cultural privilege in the United States they were there. The, they feel persecuted when they're in charge of everything, and if it doesn't run the way they want in every part of government, at their schools and everything, they're like, "You must hate Jesus," and I'm offended. And so, like, part of what I was hoping to do is, like, a lot of the jokes, like, there'll be jokes if you didn't grow up religious or Christian, you won't completely get. But if you did, you'll be laughing and like, "Am I allowed to laugh at this?" And I think. Being able to laugh at all the stuff that's connected to your faith also means you're at home and comfortable with it. And we need to do that. The, the second thing is, um, the heart of faith for me, whether you're a heretic, a doubter, you've left the faith or you're at home in it has to do with the quality of your relationships with the people in your community. And this story is the story of someone who doesn't know if he belongs in the community he came from who is stuck now in a van building a community who, with another guy who also doesn't belong where he came from. And they won, and then neither one of them can go back home till they've actually built a new relationship with each other. And so the, the correct answer to a lot of the questions we have is like building relationships and, and trusting that God's present when we show up and bring ourselves to one another. And, and I think, like that is the story of the film um, with all the jokes. And, and, the, and the third thing is like the youth ministry part of it. I hope anyone that had horrible experiences in their youth group and stuff, here's enough stories and jokes about things to remember the, the, the beautiful parts of it and mm -hmm. can affirm it, even if they can't stand half the BS that was attached to it. Mm -hmm. And I hope that youth ministers that are doing the hard work of loving people that change their whole identity every six months <laughs> and have to come up with weird, crazy games and then different ways to describe uh, <laughs> the tradition and pass it on. Go go like, yeah, like the really weird parts of what it is I do are something that mattered in this film. Um, mm -hmm. If you were someone that was deeply connected to your youth group um, or a youth minister, then there it would be hard for you not to think 
uh, like I'm one of the few people with the secret key to understanding most of what was going on in that. Mm-hmm. Right. Like when you watch clerks, which is one of my favorite movies, you watch clerks. If you ever have worked as a clerk in the, th- in any store back at the time, you were like an immediate fan. Sure. And then your friends that weren't clerks are like, is that really what happens? Is that how yeah, it goes? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah that is kind of, yeah. And so like this has that, uh, that kind of, um, what happens when you're not around yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, conversations among ministers when you aren't around kind of feel to it, which I, which I really enjoy because uh, usually ministers um, when they're played in, when they're played in films are like seventh heaven dad. Totally. just ridiculous. <laughs> or they like look amazing and smile and are the bad guy. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like when are we gonna have a film about a minister? Like, well, did they kitty touch? Still money? Uh, like finagle women on the side? Like what? What? Are, or it's like some pope from the 14th century who kills people, right? Like <laughs> this, this like Cleo is like a lot of ministers who is there because he he's like, yeah, I was born Christian. I really love it. It matters a lot to me. I love the people. I love all those things I do, and I'm not really sure about this. And then sometimes I am, and other times I don't. But this is what I am. And I can't imagine myself not being here. That's so many ministers. It's very real. That's very and, real. And I, it might like really give ministers who watch it and talk to their congregants. It, they're much more likely to have an idea of what it's like to be you after it. than if you have trouble kind of opening up that side. Sure. Sure. Okay. So uh, take me to the filming 12 days of intense filming anywhere from 10 to 16 hour days. What was what were some highlights? Give me give me the high points. What are the things that stand out to you? Um, positive, positive, positive things. Uh, well, um, I regularly during the, so there are a number of sections where I'm just harassing Nathan's character, and we filmed a lot of material, and the whole time I'm trying to get Jess to roll her eyes at me, who's like recording the sound. Right. Um, you'll hear her soon. And, um, she doesn't appreciate a lot of my humor the way I intended to be appreciated. So I would keep telling jokes and, uh, and, and then I would just keep making them worse in hopes to get, cause she had the funniest eye roll. She'd be like, <sighs> she has some big eyes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then I would try to get Nathan to laugh when, and ruin his character on stuff. And so that, like, that part was really fun. Um, the, I mean, rewarding parts for me, a lot of the people who spent like one day with us were made the big chunks of time. It was just a few of us over and over doing the same things worth it. Like all of our friends that were in Denver that did the wedding and stuff. That was like the most fun first day. Um, and then like George and cat like that, like when you have these unique characters that hang out and it breaks the, uh, monotony of just us uh that was fun um the and and not contessa not the horse don't Come like on, that talk. now if you if you are new to this uh the road to edmund backstory we have uh, i don't remember how many episodes 14 episodes something like that on youtube where i do a behind the scenes video of every day of production and uh, I was uh, excited about having a horse in one of three nightmare scenes that Cleo has. And uh, Larry is uh, going to be riding in on a horse, which is echoing the riding in of Jesus in the book of Revelation. We could not get a white horse like Jesus. We got a brown horse. And uh, the gentleman's name was Ted that was referred to us. Ted was supposed to show up and for a couple hundred bucks, he was going to teach Trip how to ride a horse. And now because it was a nightmare scene, it had to be at night. So it's around nine o'clock at night, maybe eight o'clock. I forgot the check for Ted. I drive back to the hotel. But it, but he got there before you left. It was still, I got thrown off. It hadn't even, the sun hadn't even gone down yet. It was like dusk. It was dusk, but I was gone. I was getting I the check. I come back. I get a call from uh, Brandon. Dave, we're not going to be able to do the horse scene. Trip just got thrown off the horse. <laughs> He's freaking out. I'm like, no, no, no. We're no, no worries. How's Trip? What's going on? 
I go down there and Trip is freaking out. Now, Trip, the last time you were on a horse prior to this was what? How old were you? I I was like nine or something. My mom was, told me that night when I called. <laughs> yeah, so you were nine on a horse, and you got what you you kept I saying was, beforehand that you were thrown off it or something. Yeah, yeah, that was the last time I rode a horse. But you know, I was going to ride a horse for you, Dave. I know. Because- and you were going to have like this white robe on and like a crap. It was dripped in blood. Dripped in, we had the robe dripped in blood because we're, I mean, this is a dramatic reaction. Well, Contessa, Contessa was trying to take us all out. So tell me what happened. Take me back to that Contessa moment. Contessa is the horse. Contessa is the horse. And um, Ted Tudor's the owner and trainer. Ted, Ted, Ted rolls up on the horse who's <laughs> really mad about the, about the bugs. A lot she, of bugs. <laughs> shaking her head and junk. And, and and he's like telling me what to do, and I get on the horse, and he's it's a holding large horse. It. You're a large guy. It's a large horse. It is a the yeah like like if Jesus wore, was to rock a brown horse, the apocalypse Contessa would have been great. Extra large um, horse. So we he's like you you walk. Here's how you stop. Now, don't pull too back too much or she'll jump. And I'm like, nah, I, ain't, I don't want to jump. So you're and on he, the horse at this point. He's walking me in a circle, kind of like where we will go when it's dark. And I'm sitting there going like, man, when it's dark and there are strobe lights, it's not going to be good. And and the, and the horse is like not having it. She's mad about the bugs and just like shaking Turns her head and snorting. Yeah. And Ted slaps Contessa upside the face. And it's like, settle down, settle down, girl. I'm like, hey, uh, uh, you know, this you guy's old. Horse. Yeah, Ted's not like, you know, going to be picking a fight in an alley or anything. He's like 70. So uh, I'm like, this ain't good. And Jess, who like is friends with horses, is you could, initially she's like, oh, I don't know. Like you could see her going, this doesn't look good. <laughs> Because I'm like, I don't know about this. The last one threw me off. Well, then he's then he goes, okay. We walked in the circle, and he's I, he has me holding Contessa. Then then he goes, all right, now you're gonna do it. So you've got I'm the like, range in your know. hands. Yeah, he's. I was like, nah, nah, nah. I think it'll be dark. You could just walk Contessa up, and they'll just film me. And he goes, you got it. And the moment he hands it over, Contessa puts her head down like. Puts her head down like uh, she's going to knock the bugs off and then moves up and jumps just a little bit up and headbutts Ted, who then taking three or four steps backwards because he just got headbutt by a horse. And he comes walking back forward because he wants to grab the reins. Contessa jumps once, headbutt, lands. And then next, she's just like, I don't know who this butt on my back is. That he's going. He, she jumps up big and Ted comes running back after he kind of got pushed back. And Contessa catches him right in the face with her front feet. Ted, me, thrown off, except my left foot is now in (laughs) the stinking uh, stirrup. stirrup, And Contessa's just jumping up and down (laughs) in horse speak saying, I hate you. I hate bugs. I don't want to be related to the Bible. Contessa was an atheist. And was un- wanting to be a part of this film. <laughs> like, I'm protesting. Well, uh, my foot stuck. My glasses got thrown off. So I can't see Jack. So it's like dusk dark, and a big brown thing is jumping, and it lands where my, lo- my thigh has a foot next to it on the inside. And I start screaming like a girl. Nathan comes over and Jess comes over and like someone gets my foot out and I just start rolling towards the water <laughs> till I'm far away. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I mean, I got, I mean, I landed on my shoulder and my head and I was, uh, on the woozy side of uh, life. So I come running down the hill cause there's a hill that goes down to this lower area by the river and the horse is standing. Jess has got it by its reins. It's like, <laughs> and Ted is down on one knee, his shoulder. He's just like, uh, hi Dave. Uh, my shoulder's just located <laughs> and, uh, and he's bleeding from his like forehead or something. And I said, okay, Ted, um, uh, what would be best to do right now? I know we're in a remote area. Uh, he's like, 
I think you should call 911. <laughs> Like, okay, I guess they have that here. So I called 911. And like these, like these volunteer paramedics with the, they were so happy about their new, uh, you know, ambulance and they had this new gurney that had, uh, oh, they were ready to rock. Oh, they were fired up. They were excited, actually. They're all swarming around and getting Ted up on the, the stretcher and, and he was crying out in pain. And, uh, you know, I was concerned. I was primarily concerned that the homeowner was going to maybe kick us off the property and say, Hey, you cannot film here anymore. You've caused a disaster, but he was cool. He was awesome. I was super, super thankful that he was, uh, very welcoming. And I was concerned about your well being, of course. Um, I was bummed that we didn't film that scene, but I was very happy that we actually continued filming. That was about nine o'clock at night. I think we circled up and got started filming again around 11 and we filmed until 3 a.m. That oh, night. yeah, but you had some medicine later on in the filming that made you well, feel while we were waiting for that, uh, the ambulance, um, George was giving me a hard time for crying like a uh yes, George plays Jabez and he has a uh a unique mouth. Yes. Uh, yes, it's uh he comes walking over there and I'm like I just had fallen off and I'm in like pain pain and my head is throbbing, which it did for <laughs> two or three hours. But he comes over there and he's like, What happened? I was like, I got thrown off the horse. He goes, What are you talking about? I heard somebody whining like a little. <laughs> he said, "Like a little bitch" is what he said. It's <laughs> like something like a little bitch. <laughs> I was I like, "No, I really did get thrown off." <laughs> and so, uh, and he's like, "That's not good, Trip. It's not good. You already talk too much in these scenes. I, you're going to make it go all night long. I need you." You know, he starts like lecturing me. He told me, he said, "Why is it we'll be just sitting around here talking and you're fine?" Then they start, and it's just like you're somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, George, I cannot wait for you to interview him. That is going to be one of the best podcast episodes ever. Um, and, well, the, I'm, I'm thinking we should do it right after the Super Bowl because uh, he's a huge, huge <laughs> New England fan. Yeah. So to either, if they lose, which might make for the most fun, uh, podcast, then I'm sure he won't be happy. If they win, he'll have jokes for uh, all, every other possible NFL team. He will definitely be on fire. Hey, I want to talk to you about um, some of our goals here. Now, we are planning to launch a crowdfunding campaign in a uh, little less than a month in order to fund a pre-release screening tour. So the, the desire is that we would take the film out before it's completely done uh, and get some feedback and rally people, have these conversations that we're having right now after the film, and then even uh, some things that you would offer the next day. So it, for those of you who are listening, one, if you're interested in hosting a pre-release screening at your church, organization, whatever, we're looking for 100 to 10 million people to be there. All right. In between that hundred to 10 million. And, uh, you know, like if Joel Osteen, if he's listening, I'd go there. We'd show it there. Wouldn't we? Lakewood. I we're open and affirming to venues. Yeah, totally. <laughs> we're open to, and, uh, life church in Edmond, Oklahoma. Uh, we I know I tweeted them. I, I haven't heard back yet. They, tw I saw the tweet. They did not respond. Um, so, in order to do that, uh, it does require some finances to be able to come out and make that happen. Uh, Trip, now you are in conjunction with some of our pre-release screenings doing an event the next day on a Saturday that you call Theology Beer Camp. Is that correct? Well, depending on which, uh, which city and stuff, I'm doing a number of different things. Like uh, when we go to uh, Denver, um, we're going to be doing... Uh, there'll be like a minister workshop and then, okay. uh, so, so let me uh, ask you this throw I'm basically, out I'm basically doing whatever the people need us to do. So we don't lose money when we go show the film. Perfect. So you know what I'm talking about, 
I will I'll preach. I'll do a talk for anybody on a whole host of topics. I'll will you ride a horse? horse? Will you ride I'll, a horse? I will not ride a horse. <laughs> I will watch you ride a horse. I would be willing. Okay, so let's throw this out there. If you're listening and you want to do a pre-release screening and you're open to trip then doing something the next day, Saturday or Sunday, um, uh, what, what are the options of things that people might be interested in having you come do? Um, well, uh, I know I'm doing some podcasts for people uh, to and like a school sponsoring one. So it include a lot of their professors and stuff. So that's uh, where those who haven't been a part of your podcast, it's where you have experts. You guys sit down, you talk about theological issues, you drink a lot of beer and there's a lot of great merriment. Yeah. And the, and the thing about a podcast that's cool is, um, you know, it's kind of like a late night show meets Charlie Rose with God talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the, the edited version then gets put out on homebrewed and then promoted in the email list and stuff. So, you know, if you're like, Oh, well, um, it's advertising. Know, I, I yeah. Mind. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it turns into, you know, our email list is over 35,000 people, 70,000 people are going to listen to it. So my thing was, and I have a list of all these ideas I made. I don't have them with me, but if people are interested in email you or me, I'll give them a list. Cause I'm like, I'll do whatever you want. I'll preach, teach, speak, do an event, uh, do a live podcast. Um, one of them is like, can you help me run a promotion campaign for my book online? I'm like, yeah, there you go. I'll do that. Uh, sure. whatever is necessary. Cause, um, what we're really wanting to do is to get as many people who, would naturally be interested, like if you're listening to this or connected with the podcast or you know that kind of thing, to have a have all the justification they need to show it, so we can show it to as many people as possible, get feedback, um, and you know get a nice polished final version to uh, take out, and uh, I, you know obviously someone's going to sell and put it on a million screens. That's probably what's going to happen. Bottom line, bottom line. Yeah. If people and next do, time I'm gonna I'm gonna, I my standards are gonna go up. I'm gonna say, look, I will star in your movie, but it costs extra to get all the skin. Because <laughs> I now have I have an IMDB page now, so like I just don't I just don't drop the top for nobody, you know what I mean? <laughs> so if you are interested in hosting a screening uh, and an event with Trip afterwards or in conjunction, we would love to be able to do that with you because the goal, as Trip said, is one, get feedback on the film, two, create a groundswell, uh, a movement of people that are excited about using this film to create conversation, not only in their church, faith community, nonprofit, even their just community at large. Like, consider this film a tool, a resource to jumpstart conversation about faith sexuality and jesus that is one of the huge goals that we have beyond making you laugh hysterically until you cry so you can get in touch with trip uh trip t-r-i-p-p at homebrewedchristianity.com you can get in touch with me david d-a-v-i-d at the road to edmund.com those are two options and, and one thing i guess so this is probably the more obvious one one thing i'm doing um that, well, I'm in talks with a possible host and they're doing is the workshop actually be on how you think through and discuss the kind of big topics in the film itself. Uh, and the three they were talking about is uh, sexuality, science, and um, uh, religious diversity. Good and stuff. so the, the workshop stuff will be uh, where I kind of introduce three different answers Christians give to the very the same questions and how each perspective sees scripture playing out and that kind of thing in it so that if you're in the room you kind of one understand more of the reasons people that share your perspective have it out of their faith and not just because oh like I know a lot of progressives they're like oh those homophobes but it's not like you ever asked them like so as a Christian like how do you understand gender and sexuality they are like i don't know it's just just what i think and vice versa Mm -hmm. so like how do you understand perspectives across the spectrum coming out of their faith and then how do we learn to love respect and acknowledge each other in difference and converse and that kind of thing um and uh so one one group's talking about doing that and you know that easily fits the film where you watch it and stuff and the next day can have you know conversation yeah. Yeah, it's great. Perfect. All right. Well, hey, uh, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and the like. And we are 
in the process. Well, I want to know. I want to know when you're editing. What like what you were sitting there, not sleeping, and then going through it. Um, I'm anticipating that I'll see stuff when I'm watching, and I don't remember saying it all. Oh yeah, I'm laughing. Well, what, so what in going through all the uh, all the different scenes as you're going through, like what's a what's a moment you didn't anticipate being a moment that you're like, oh, when that's on screen. Um, or that moment really stuck or landed? Oh, man. Well, I have been editing this film for the last couple months. It feels like, I don't know, maybe it's been a month. And I start early in the morning and work for a number of hours before I get on with my other work as a marketing consultant and so forth. My wife, who gets up early as well, she gets up at like 445 to work out every day as a teacher before she goes to teach. And so she will hear me in my office laughing out loud and open the door. And she's like, it cracks me up that you're laughing at like five in the morning. I go, I know, but this is so funny. You know, um, I will say that uh, the scene where you are going off in the van at the rainbow gas station about Cleo's interaction with pastor, uh, his pastor is, uh, that's very powerful. And that will create so much conversation, positive, negative, all the way around. You know what I mean? That really is going to, to really mess with people. Um, I, I think as I mentioned to you in our first conversation, episode one of this podcast, it's an equal opportunity offender. It is hilarious. It will push the boundaries and buttons of people who are conservative, progressive, and in the middle. And I think that's what's funny about it. I think it allows us to laugh at different things, laugh at ourselves, um, stretch our thinking about uh, life. It's a powerful movie. It really is. And I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. We have no clue what's going to happen. But I do want to get it in front of as many people as possible with these pre-release screenings so that we create uh, an interest. you know. And we want, uh, when the time is right, for as many articles to be written and people to be talking about it and sharing about it and wrestling through it. And I'm sure there's going to be, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of negative reaction from some people and a lot of positive reaction. So... That's the whole point. It creates conversation. See, it makes conversation. And I support conversation. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. All right. Well, Tripp, I, uh, I admire you. I, I admire what you're doing. I love your heart. I love your heart for people. Um, I appreciate your willingness to be a part of this project. And um, I, I just think that um, it's going to be good. The ultimate result of all of this is goodness in the world there you go oh so, yeah all right dude uh until next time follow us subscribe itunes have you left a a, a review trip on itunes for our podcast no it's so easy now on the new app the podcast app on, for apple um you just bam hit five stars you can write a little something if any of you want to do that on the podcast app for with itunes uh stitcher pocket cast any of that stuff it helps people be able to find us more easily so feel free to do that all right guys have a great week bye peace